95th Psalm, we'll begin reading, verse number 1. The Bible says, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hands, in his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Let's pray. Father, we sure do bless you. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you for the good singing. Thank you for the good testimonies. And thank you for this season of thanksgiving when we can pay homage and give gratitude and appreciation unto you for all the great things that you have bestowed upon us. Bless now the furtherance of this service. Bless the reading of the word of God. And I pray as Brother Brian prayed when we opened the service, if there be any amongst us lost without God, that they would come and trust in Christ even this very night. Then, Father, we certainly pray for the saints of God, that you would help them, you'd bless them, you'd do great things for them. Send revival, and God, may we truly be thankful in our hearts and with our lips towards God. We'll thank you for it, for it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen and amen. Psalms 95 is a psalm that really has two sections. It talks at the beginning about praising God and singing unto God and rejoicing into God. Uh, and then uh, just a little over midway through the psalm, uh, it changes the whole uh, conjecture of the psalm and says, uh, if you can't praise God, if you don't know God and you can't sing unto God and can't rejoice in God, uh, then don't harden your heart as in the day of provocation. Uh, in other words, get born again. Because the day of provocation, when your fathers were in the wilderness and tempted me uh, and proved me, uh, they erred in their heart. And God said, I swore in my wrath uh, that they would perish. Uh, my dear friends, if you're here today and not saved, uh, you have a, a great opportunity and you're in the right place uh, uh, to give your heart and life to the Lord. But don't harden your heart uh, because you only do that so much uh, and God will swear in his wrath that you will suffer for eternity and be punished for rejecting him. Uh, I want to look at a few things as a way of introduction. I want you to notice when speaking of worship, you know, we talk about worship and people have an ideal of what worship may or may not be. Unfortunately, a lot of times our ideals of worship is nothing more than a ritual or a ceremony or going through the motions. But this psalm begins and it outlines worship. Notice about worship. When it comes to worship, the first thing we're to do is we're to rise to the occasion. Notice what it says in verse number 1. He says, Oh, come. Now, if you just read that, you may be thinking that this is an invitation to come and sing and rejoice in the Lord, but it's much more than an invitation. As a believer, it is our responsibility to come, uh, but it's more than just attending. It's more than just showing up. Uh, it is uh, 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 the connotation behind this word, O oh, come, uh, is to rise to the occasion, uh, uh, to lay aside every weight, uh, every obstacle, uh, every problem, uh, to put aside any thought out of your mind uh, and arise above anything that you may uh, contend with uh, uh, and come to the occasion where you will worship Almighty God uh, above all things. Uh, 
It is a rise to the occasion. Unfortunately, we allow our circumstances to affect our worship or the lack thereof. We do not rise to the occasion. There are many novels written and many movies have been produced uh, about figureheads who have uh, faced great odds uh, and when uh, 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 it came time uh, uh, to toe the line they rise to the occasion and overcame everything to become successful and we herald them as superheroes but my dear friends uh, the true superhero is the ones who can contend with the world, the flesh, and the devil, and lay all that aside and rise to the occasion to worship and adore the Lord Jesus Christ. We see the rise to the occasion. Can I say also, when speaking of worship, we find we're to refrain in song. Look what it says. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Thank God for a song. I'm glad there's a song in due season. I'm glad that we have a song that the world cannot sing. We have a song that the unbelievers do not know about. I'm glad we have a song that lives praise unto God and it will manifest what we believe and feel in our heart and we sing to bring glory and honor to Him. Now, Brother Clint's been trying a little praise and worship, singing a little chorus the last couple of Wednesdays, but they're true choruses, and no, it's not really praise and worship. Uh, but listen, anything that truly sings a glory to God, is that not really praise? And we cannot have worship without praise. We see that we're to rise to the occasion, we're to refrain in song, but we're also to recognize our rock. Look what it says. O cub, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. We're to recognize who we're singing about. If you get him on your mind because you got him in your heart, you can sing and you can worship. When you just come in and you're just looking at the words on the page, you may be singing, but it's not a joyful noise to the Lord. And by the way, while we're here, since some of you look like you'd pass out, you got turkey on the brain, Brother Tommy? Yeah. But where this idea came about that you can sound like a cat squalling in the midnight hour because a dog's chewed its tail off, but that's what you sound like, and, and as long as you're doing it for the Lord, it says, make a joyful noise, the Lord. The Lord don't love that noise. It's just noise. Huh? A joyful noise to the Lord is a song from the heart. Now, you may not be able to carry a tune in the bucket, but if it's coming from your heart because you're rejoicing over what Jesus done in your life, it is a joyful noise under our rock. Hmm? Amen. Uh, notice, if you will, the regard. Look in verse number two. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Amen. We're to regard him with gratitude and appreciation. You know why some people don't worship? They don't realize what it costs for them to be here. When you see what God did, that he left heaven and that he went to Calvary, Brother Donald, and that he shed his blood so that we would have the privilege of knowing uh, uh, about him and have the privilege of having a relationship with him, Brother Rob, and having our sins washed away. When we realize what it costs God uh, for us to be able to have this privilege, uh, we can worship. Yeah. Amen. We will regard him. Uh, when we get to the point where we think we deserve God's blessings... My dear friends, he will stop his blessings. Notice we're to rejoice if we're going to worship. He says, and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. We're to rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice. We're to be happy, happy, happy. 
Yeah. You say, well, I've had a bad day. Yeah, but you're not in hell. And the next time you're having a bad day, because you will have some bad days, please do this. Get you out a notepad and write down everything that was bad about your day. And then I want you to flip it over and write down everything good about Jesus and what Jesus has done in your life. And when you get done, see if there's a whole lot more on that Jesus side than there is on the bad day side. Before long, you'll start rejoicing when you see how much God has done for you. A lot of times we get to having a bad day. We get to feel sorry for ourselves. We think God's forgotten about us. But if you truly start listing all the privileges you have in being saved, hallelujah, friend, you'll turn that bad day into a good day. Sure. We're to rejoice. We're to regard. Um, but when we're going to worship, and if you're really going to worship, you've got to be reminded of the reason for worship. Look at verse 3. For the Lord is a great God yes. and a great King yeah. above all gods. That's why we rejoice. He's not only a great God and a great King, He's our God. Our King. Our Rock. Right. Our Savior. Our friend that's sticking closer than a brother. Hmm? So with all this in mind, with it being Thanksgiving Eve, with verse 2 telling us, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. I want to preach for just a few minutes on this thought on true thanksgiving. True thanksgiving. Hmm. I, I tweeted the other day because I, I read this definition and I, and I liked it and I tweeted it and as I was putting this message together this afternoon it came back to my mind so I listed it because some of you don't get tweets. Uh, I found on dictionary.com because I was somewhere and didn't have my dictionary with me and I got to thinking about something and I looked it up on dictionary. I pulled up on dictionary. On, on, thank God for Google. Amen. Yeah. And I got dictionary.com, and I pulled this up. Dictionary.com gives the definition of thanksgiving as this. It's the act of giving thanks, being grateful, and the acknowledgement of benefits or favors, especially to God. Now, I guess they still do it. Kids, help me if they don't. But when I was in school 100 years ago, uh, Thanksgiving time, you'd always have the, the play at the school where you'd have the pilgrims and the Indians would come and bring the food to the pilgrims. They had the first Thanksgiving. They still do that, kids? Everybody send your kids to Beachwood. They still have uh, pilgrims uh, plays there, all right? Uh, uh, you mean to tell me, Colton, you didn't get to dress up as an Indian? Man, you guys don't know what... We would spend weeks making our costumes out of construction paper and, you know, glue and macaroni on, on, you know, cardboard and all kinds of... I mean, we made all these costumes, huh? And we put on the... Now, when, when Jordan and Christian were little uh, and in middle school, they did a whole old-fashioned week where they actually made... Uh, uh, stuff like the pilgrims did it and then they had old and and uh we had a pilgrim costume made for jordan and miss annette dressed up in and uh, uh, uh what the ladies would have wore back then it was old-fashioned day and then christian come up behind jordan and the costume was four times bigger than, than christian could wear we had to have it cut down you know jordan was a husky and christian was a slim uh, back in those days but christian's catching up to him now huh but i can't believe that they don't do the pilgrims with you Oh, man, America's going, going to pop, I'm telling you. I said that because of this. I read this this week. I thought it was really good. Those, that first year the pilgrims were here, they built more graves than they did homes. Let that sink in. Because of the disease, and because of the roughness of the winter, and because they weren't prepared to feed themselves, more of them died than survived. And that's why the natives took pity on them and brought them food. But even in that horrible state, they still offered thanksgiving to God. Amen. 
and God has blessed us and blessed us and blessed us and blessed us, we'll throw away more food than the rest of the world has. And yet we won't take time to give thanksgiving unto God. I'm talking about America as a whole. Hmm? I want to look at some things about true thanksgiving. Hmm? Did I tell this story about Pilgrim? I mentioned Christian and, and, and Jordan. Let me tell a story about Sydney. When Sydney was little, when Sydney was about Addie's age, we'd had a preacher in town and we dropped him off over to Moketown and there was some, some, some Quakers or somebody there, you know. And they was there and Sydney says, Look, Mom, Pilgrims. <laughs> well, they kind of look like Pilgrims if you think about it. But anyway, that's, that's my Sydney story. huh? Hmm. Let's talk about true thanksgiving. Can I say, true thanksgiving, first of all, embodies honor. It, it, it embodies honor. Look again in verse 3. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. You cannot have thanksgiving with not having appreciation without having gratitude. And you cannot appreciate and have gratitude towards God uh, without showing Him the honor that He deserves. Uh, he is to be reverenced. Uh, he is to be put on the pedestal of pedestals. Uh, he is holy. Uh, he is almighty. Uh, he is our God. Uh, and we, my dear friends, when we realize uh, 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 He gives us our very breath and our body, uh, He's the one that provides everything we have. Uh, all your clothes, all your shoes, the house, you live in, uh, the car you drive, the food you have in your house, uh, hey, uh, the money to pay your electric bill, all of it came from the hand of Almighty God. Uh, hey, you're not born in a third world country. Uh, you're in America. Uh, you have a bounty uh, and a supply that the rest of the world can't comprehend. Uh, I mean, God has been good to us. Uh, and when you realize who He is, uh, He's holy, He's almighty, He's wonderful counselor uh, hey you will truly give him honor uh, true thanksgiving embodies honor when people aren't thankful and they're selfish they are thumbing their nose up at God everything you had came from the hand of God Amen. Mm, true thanksgiving is about honor and respect Mm. I get upset when people don't respect the flag. Amen. I get upset when people don't respect the sanctuary. Yes, I get upset when people don't uh, respect some of the very things that have made America what, what they are. But I really get upset when people don't respect God. Right. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about lost people. They don't know God. You don't expect them to respect God. But I can tell you this. I know lost people that have a more of a conscience and show God more respect than some people that claim, claim to be saved. Yeah. Amen. True thanksgiving embodies honor. But it also embodies humility. Look at verse 6. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Amen. Can I say, in, in order to truly honor Him, you must humble yourself. Yes, sir. When we really offer thanksgiving, we are telling God we would not have what we have without Him. Amen. And we must do as John said, I must decrease and He must increase. Amen. And true thanksgiving uh, is honoring Him and respecting Him and giving Him the thanks and the appreciation and the gratitude uh, and uh, us recognizing we have what we have because of all He has given. Yes, yes sir. You didn't make yourself. You're not a self-made anything. Amen. What you have came because God chose to bless you. And when you recognize that, that is the truest form of humility. I couldn't even get out of bed on my own without God. 
God is the one that sustains us. God's the one that supplies for us. God is the one who has done all that he's done in our lives. And true thanksgiving recognizes who he is and recognizes really what we are. We're a zero with the hole knocked out of it. Amen. It's all about him. Yes. Can I say something else about true thanksgiving? True thanksgiving has to have harmony. We've got to be in tune with God. Brother Rod talked about the relationship. You've got to be in tune with him if you're going to offer up thanks to him. Can I say this? You will never show him gratitude while you have malice in your heart. You will never worship him with anger in your soul. It can't happen. But, you know, one preacher said this, his name's Paul Chappell, said this, the foundation of gratitude is the expectation of nothing. And when you expect nothing from God, but you want to tell him how great he is and how appreciative you are for what he's done, that, my dear friends, yes. is true expression of thanksgiving. Good. But can I say, you not only got to be in harmony with him, you got to be in harmony with those around you. How can I worship him when I'm angry with my brother? How can I be thankful to him when I'm angry with him? We have the story in the scriptures where a man had a great debt and he was forgiven of his debt and he leaves the jail and finds somebody who owes him little and he has him beaten and thrown into prison. And that's how many of us are. God has forgiven us a great debt and yet we can't forgive somebody else something small and insignificant. And when we're that way, we cannot worship God and offer up true thanksgiving. <clears throat> How can we recognize him for who he is when we're not what we should be? Hmm? Must be harmony. Must be harmony. Every great move of God happens when there's unity. Every great recognition from God where his spirit shows up or his glory shows up happens when there's harmony. My dear friends, and the reason so many people don't have anything to really thank God for. The reason some people can't worship, the reason some people are so miserable is they're not in tune with God. Mm. And Brother Phil brings that banjo out and starts twisting all them strings in different uh, directions, starts trying to play it. It'll sound like a mess because it's not in tune. That's what our worship sounds like to God when we're not in tune with Him. True thanksgiving must have honor and humility and harmony. Can I say this? True thanksgiving, it embodies hope. Assurance. Isn't it amazing when you just start thanking God for what he's done, how much peace you get in your heart? Amen. I said this several years ago. We'd have true revival if we'd just get thankful. I was talking to somebody today, and we was talking, and, and, and we got off on society, and we got off on these, these young kids, these kids in college that are embracing all this talk of socialism and the country going socialistic, and, and, and you know, it, it all sounds good to these kids. You get free college, you get free health care, you get free everything. But these kids haven't lived long enough to know that somebody's got to pay for it. And you can believe these politicians all you want to, but the rich people don't pay for it. The rich people got rich because they know how to get out of paying for it. Hmm? They hold on to theirs. It all sounds wonderful, but you know why kids will so rapidly embrace that? Because they've never had to work for anything. When you've actually had to punch a time clock and go to work, and then you get that ch a check after you've worked a week or two weeks, however they pay, and you see how much taxes were taken out yeah. so that you can pay for people who don't work, you don't like socialism all of a sudden. But I, I, I said this to the person I was talking to. We, he brought all that up and everything. We was talking about I said, you know what the problem is? We've raised some generations that are soft. All they know to do is play video games, 
be on their phones. They don't know how to work. They don't know what it is to put in blood, sweat, and tears to get something. And so when somebody else comes by and asks if, you know, tells them what going to get everything for free, sign me up because that's my whole life. Everything I've wanted, I've been spoiled, I've gotten. Hmm? Some of your parents need to quit spoiling your kids and your grandkids. Oh, you spoil them some. Just don't give them everything. Make them work a little bit for it. Make them take out the trash. Make them clean out the garbage cans. Make them cut the grass. Make them do a little bit. It'll help them. Because i got news for you. One of these days they're going to have to go to work. Unless Bernie Sanders is still alive in the president. <laughs> but if they don't go to work or if Bernie does institute socialism, they're never going to have anything. Amen. Hmm? Brother Jack, can you imagine when you was a boy just laying in the house playing video games all day long? <laughs> huh? Your daddy would have beat you senseless, wouldn't he? Yeah, boy, you're lazy. Get outside, hmm? huh? Yeah, but we didn't want to be inside. Hey, you know one thing kids don't have today? Bicycles. We used to ride the tires off those things, man. Huh? We learned how to dodge cars and bikes, so then we was ready to drive. Huh? Man, they didn't have that. They don't have, you know, they don't know how to play ball anymore. It's too hot. We didn't have air conditioning when I was a kid. huh? You wanted to be outside. It was cooler outside than it was in the house. Especially if you was at my grandma's house. She had two ovens and they was both going all the time. huh? Didn't want to be in the house. Wanted to run around and everything. These kids got it. They're soft. You know why? Because we haven't enveloped in them hope. You know one of the good things about getting a driver's license and then getting a job and, and doing it. You get stuff in return. There's hope. Huh? Well, you know what the good thing is about worshiping God? We get hope. Sure. When God meets with you and you reverence Him and you, you show Him the homage and the thanksgiving, uh, uh, He overwhelms you with peace and then all of a sudden uh, uh, when you're home and you start reading the Bible, you find out, hey! We can meet together again. There's more hope. Maybe next Sunday he'll show up bigger and better. And then one day, hallelujah, we got that blessed hope. When we're checking out of this world, we're going to the glory world. Uh, I don't want to wait till then to worship. Uh, I want to get practiced up and be ready. Uh, so when we step off over into glory, I know what to do. Hallelujah, huh? I used to make people matter and wet in. You can't imagine that. I always wanted to have what they called children's church. Let's have children's church. Why we have Sunday morning service? Let's have the children over have children's church. I said, was well, there going to be a preacher? Oh well, no. We're going to sing a few songs and give them a little, a little book to color in and give them some little cookies. And uh, I said, well, that's babysitting. That ain't children's church. If it's going to be children's church, you need to sing Zacchaeus' wee little man. You need to sing deep and wide. You need to sing uh, 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 this little light of mine and get a, get a preacher to preach to them. That's church. Well, a no, preacher, you're being unreasonable. I said, no, they need to sit in the sanctuary. Why? They make too much noise. And I said, that's when I started adopting the phrase, I can preach louder than any scream. But why do you think the children around here knows there's something important about going to the altar. Hmm? I see little Charlie Five go to the altar. Why do you think he, he thinks there's something special to that? He's only been saved about a year. Because huh? he's raised in church where there's an altar. Huh? And can I help you something? These little ones, they don't understand everything Brother Doug's preaching, but they do know it's important why Brother Doug's preaching. And they pick up a whole lot more than you think. Because they're being raised around it. And that's important. 
Oh yeah, we have a, a, a youth ministry that teaches them on their level uh, uh, so they can grasp it. Uh, uh, but it all comes together because when they reach the age of accountability, uh, God starts touching their little tender hearts uh, and they realize there's a place that they can come and they can meet God uh, and Jesus will forgive them of their sins. Uh, you don't learn how to worship in children's church. And that's what happens in a lot of these churches. They raise the kids out somewhere else till they're about 18, 19, bring them in the sanctuary, and then they're bored to death. Hmm? They don't understand what worship is. And by the way, most of those churches don't have worship anyway. They have formality. Uh, but can I say, when you truly worship and offer thanksgiving, there's so much hope. Miss hmm? Noreen, I... I have a burden for your family. But the hope is Jesus loves them. And he wants to save them. And he knows how faithful you are and how much you love him. You know, if, if, if I could do it for you, I would. Well, don't you think the Lord who can do it for you, don't you think he takes note of that? Hmm? Boy, I, I, I have hope. My hope's not in the Baptists that her dad warned her about. There are a bunch of mean-spirited Baptists. My hope's not in the government. My hope's in Jesus. Amen. And Jesus can do great things for her family. Yeah. Amen. Hmm? Every time we come to church, I come to church with hope in my soul that God's going to show up and do something great. Hmm? If I didn't have that hope, I wouldn't come. If I didn't have hope when I opened this book, he wasn't going to speak to me. I'd never open the book. I find that he is so good that uh, uh, I read this book and then there are times when I'm, uh, I don't have it in front of me, he still speaks to me. Yeah. I was watching Brother Ray nail some nails the other day or drive some screws or whatever he's doing. He's making a lot of noise in my house. And all of a sudden, the Lord just starts speaking to me. I mean, if God can speak to you when Brother Ray's around, I mean, you've got to have some hope. True thanksgiving has hope. What to say, Jordan, I'm preaching. Turn around and listen to me. Don't talk to Ray. He can't hear anyway. He just ignored you. He's retired. He lost his hearing. We're going to have to put him and Miss Janet on the same bench. Hmm. Let me say this. True worship true worship it's about honor it's about humility it's about hope but true worship is where we get help we face a real world that hates everything about God Amen. and this world as wicked as that part is, we live around folks that are moral, good people. They don't hate God, but they're not Christian. And if you spend enough time against it, that'll drag you down. We live in a world that doesn't rest. It's going 100 miles an hour, and we get caught up in it. We get to where we're running 100 miles an hour. Our minds are racing. Our, our, our lives are racing. And then we have to face the flesh. And we know we need to read the Bible. We know we need to pray. We know we need to do right. We know all that stuff, but our life's going 100 miles an hour, and you can find the time to pray and find the time to read the Bible and find the time. And all that is a conflict. And then you get that sorry, no good devil it sneaks up, whispers in your ear, Well, you didn't read the Bible enough this week. You're, you're sorry, no good Christian. Or, oh, you're not a very good Christian. You, you didn't fast this week. You're going to be guilty of gluttony tomorrow. Amen. But listen, you got all that going against you. When you can truly find yourself in a position to really worship, rise to the occasion, and come and offer thanksgiving to God, pay Him the honor and the respect He deserves, humble yourself before Him, get in harmony with Him, and have that hope from Him. You know what happens? You get help. How many times have you come into the house of God really feeling lower than a snake's belly? And then all of a sudden God shows up and sits down in the middle of your lap. 
and you walk out of here walking on cloud nine because you got help. When you truly rise to the occasion of worship, you can't help but get help. When we don't get help, it's not God's fault. It's because we didn't truly honor him and humble him. We let everything else that's going on rob us of truly offering thanksgiving to God. Worship can really be defined as thanksgiving to God. So let's not just celebrate Thanksgiving the last Thursday of November. And, you know, I'm thankful that somewhere other than schools in Boone County, kids hear about the pilgrims. They hear about things that went on, and all of a sudden they, they start realizing there there has to be a, 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 a day that we have thanksgiving and we watch football and eat food but somewhere they're going to have to question well, who are we being thankful to right. I'm glad for that but as Christians shouldn't we celebrate thanksgiving every single day Amen. because of how great a God we serve he is worthy of our praise when we don't offer thanksgivings because we haven't taken time to reflect on how many great things he's done for us. And I'm glad we took a little time tonight to reflect on how great a God he really is. Amen. When was the last time you really thanked him for being so good? Tonight might be a good night. If you're here tonight and you don't know him, this would be a great night to get saved. So you can put your faith and trust in him and tomorrow's Thanksgiving will be the best Thanksgiving you've ever had. Because you know what it's really about. Amen. Let's all stand, Brother Clint. Come and get a song of invitation. While he's getting a song, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Words fail us and are not available to truly express how thankful and grateful we are for all your choice blessings. You blessed us with health. You blessed us with sustenance. You blessed us with the gospel. You blessed us with a good church family. God, you've blessed us beyond our comprehension. God, we are so thankful for what great things you have done. Now, Father, I pray if there's anybody unsaved, God, you'd convict them. God, you'd draw them to yourself. We'd see them saved. God, I pray for your people. You'd bless them. Lord, you have blessed them so much but you'd bless them that they could pour out the blessings on others through praise and through sacrifice that others too may come to know you. God, I pray you do great things for your people because you're a great God. And Lord, we'll not fail to thank you for it for it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.